and to be live with uh, sound and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, this week, I, I hope things went well for you last week. Did you do any peculiar kinds of things? Well, that was the week before, actually. But so we we'll get our we'll get our rhythm going here. But um, so this week we're looking at you know how do we how do we share right? How do we share our faith? And that's an interesting thing. I I want to start off by asking a question, and I guess. Um, you know, it, let me ask it this way. Like, how many of you came to believe in God because you heard, you know, a, um, a radio message, like something on the radio about God? Anybody? How about television? Anybody come to believe in God because of something you heard on the television, like you saw a television preacher or something like that? Um, how about, how many of you came to believe in God um, because you heard a sermon in a church? That sermon in the church really, really, you know, just convinced you that God existed and you wanted to know God and that kind of thing. Okay. How about, how many of you, a parent, it was a parent that um, sort of led you that way. Okay, good. How about a friend? Anybody a friend? Okay, good. Okay. Um, maybe a neighbor or something like that? Or Okay, neighbor. Okay. Okay. Um, it's interesting. Or no, how about another relative? Like another relative, maybe it's a grandmother or something like that. What's interesting to me is that we often get worried about sharing our faith, and yet somebody has shared their faith with us, and that's why we're here. And if you think back how they did that, you'll probably find that there, were, there are non-threatening ways, both for the person who's sharing as well as for the person that's receiving, that this can be done. But also realize that the majority of people that come to faith in Christ do so, like 80%, or more than 80%, come to faith because somebody who's a, a friend or a relative has taken the time to share with them about God. And I think that's so important for us to realize. Um, and, and it's not just like, a, I want you to sit down, you know, I'm concerned you're going to go to hell, and so you better say yes to Jesus today because I don't want that to happen. But it's really in the context of the relationship where we have a chance to walk with somebody to come alongside of them when they're hurting, you know, to share how God has seen us through different things. And, and I really want you to think about it that way today because Smith is really capturing this notion of hope. And hope is a very important thing. And you know what, as Christians, you know, we have a hope within us that we can share with other people. There's a great passage, and you probably already looked at it, or you will at least in your, in your groups, but it's out of 1 Peter. And actually it's interesting because um, it's a passage in the context where the author is talking about the church really being persecuted. It's in 1 Peter um, chapter 3, and I'm looking about verse 15. He says this, though. He says, you know, don't be afraid of doing what's right. It would be better to get in trouble for doing what's wrong, right? So he says if you're doing the right thing and you end up in trouble or somebody, you know, persecutes you, that don't worry about that because as long as you're doing the right thing, that's what matters. And he says this, he says, but always in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Okay, so there's one of the first things, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So there's two things in this verse that I think are important. Number one is, you know, be ready to make a defense. Um, the second thing is because there is a hope in you. There's a reason why you have hope. And today we want to focus in on that whole message of hope. And, and why is that so crucial, not only for us, but for the world. But notice also, I love these two qualifiers. You know, he says, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know, don't cram it down people's throats. You know, show respect, show reverence. Um, this is another person created in the image of God. So as you're sharing you know, do it gently and reverently. So this whole idea of hope is very important. And there was a great quote a while ago that said this, that um, a person can live about 40 days without food. They can live about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only a second without hope. And so if you think about it, hope, even though it's not as tangible as water and food and air, it is something that we all need to have. In fact, Viktor Frankl wrote an interesting book called um, Man's Search for Meaning. And in that, he talked about um, the concentration camps during the Second World War, and Auschwitz in particular. And he talked about how the people that survived the concentration camp 
were people who had a hope of a future. They had a sense of purpose, something that they wanted to accomplish still, and that that helped them to support, you know, to survive the atrocities that were taking place in that um, in that concentration camp. So, so hope is a very important piece. And if Christ has given us hope, and this hope, as Peter says, dwells in us, then it's going to bubble up, and we're going to have chances to share with people, you know, why we're hopeful people even in the midst of difficult times. So, so we're on this whole idea of, you know, sharing our faith, all that kind of stuff. You know, we've got to figure this out. I, I like the way that um, Smith talks a little bit about um, how we disqualify ourselves from doing this. And um, page 45, you might get a chance to look at that. But I like this, you know, I, I'm not good at it. I've tried. I just stammered and stuttered. I've seen people witnessing, and I'd be embarrassed to try. I'm afraid I'll offend if I share my faith. I feel like a hypocrite if I shared my faith. I'm not perfect. I bring up my faith. I'm afraid they'll reject me. I can't share my faith with others because I'm not educated enough. I mean, it's interesting. I think we we tend to think of sharing our faith as, um, you know, sort of an assignment. Or we think of it as, um, you know, something that we've got to figure out how we do it. Like, we've got to slip in the right word at the right time. And, and what I want to th you to think about more than that is, is how do you honestly just share your story with people? How do you honestly really come alongside people and just share your story? There's a great, um, if you ever, have you ever heard of the skit guys before? Um, I'll try to bring one of their skits in, but they have this great, you know, they, they do all these skits for churches and they're just hilarious. And um, they have this one about inviting somebody to church, right? And so, you know, the one neighbor pulls up and, you know, he uh, gets out of the car and it's Sunday morning and the neighbor over in the next yard looks over and says, he always goes to church. I wonder why he doesn't invite me to church. I wish he'd invite me to church sometime. And, and the guy over next door, you know, who just came from church, looks at his neighbor and says, you know, I bet he'd never want to go to church. You know, I mean, look at him. He's just doing his yard work. You know, in fact, maybe I should stay home sometime and do my yard work. And, and then he says, he says, well, actually, you know, I need to go over. I'll just go over and I'll invite him, you know, to come to dinner at our house. So he's going to go over and do that. So he walks over and he says, hi, Fred, how are you? I'm good, Ed, how are you? And they talk a little bit. And then, then he says, um, you know, Fred, I was wondering if sometime, if you'd like to, and, and the Ed says, go to church with you. And he said, no, no, I, I wasn't going to say that. I mean, come over for dinner. You know, and it's like, but it's so interesting because I think we, you know, we sort of disqualify ourselves because we feel like, you know, it's just too much to ask somebody. But the reality is that maybe people are actually looking for this and they're not sure how to find it. And um, it's very hard to show up at a church when you don't know anybody. But if you know that someone will meet you there and will sit with you, that's a big difference. So, um, so I want to propose, I guess, in this whole reading of Smith's stuff that, um, you know, to think about this. I, I envision this um, in my own life. I mean, I, I, being the whole pastor card thing gets a little bit tacky or a little bit, you know, tried. Like, people are like, well, yeah, you're a church person, you know, a pastor. We expect you to, you know, invite us or do something. But, but the reality is that I try to just have a good relational approach with all my neighbors. You know, I you know, try to find out who they are, get to know their kids. I mean, we do this with people, you know, because they're our neighbors, because we like them, we're our friends. And, and then basically, you know, there's always some kind of time when something's going on with them. And I'll simply say, you know, I'm, I'll be praying for you during this time. Or, or I'll even say, would you like to be on our prayer list at church? And, and it's amazing. I've never had anybody say no to that. I've never had anybody say no to that. Um, even people that aren't sure about God feel like, you know, what could it hurt, right? I mean, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it'll be good, you know? So, I mean, it's so interesting. But again, you know, it's not the, you know, okay, I want you to change your whole life for me in three seconds and then I'm out of here kind of thing. It's all in the context of relationship. So, so here's an interesting thing to think about. Um, we have this hope in us, and maybe God brings people around us that need to get that hope too. And so this week, what I would like you to do is actually, you know, be thinking about who you're praying for. Who is it that you are praying that God might lead you, might lead into a conversation about what you believe? And um, it's not something you have to force. You'll be surprised how easy oftentimes these things come up. And, um, and don't be afraid of that, but see how you can enter into it. So he also goes on to talk about, um, you know, 
I think again we think it's always our mouth. And he quotes um, he quotes um, uh, Francis of Assisi, you know, who is attributed with saying, you know, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Now there's lots of debate about whether Francis actually said that or not. There is a um, there is one quote though that um, in one of in his Rule of Life in chapter 12 that says preach by your deeds. So you capture you capture the idea. A lot of times we think our words are what really impact people, but actually in the Christian life, it's really the things that we do, our actions, that often impact people more. And I can say one thing but do another thing and and totally undermine what I'm saying by my actions, right? So, you know, this whole idea that, you know, you may be the only Bible they read, and Smith talked about, you know, feeling pressure about that, but, but here's the thing. Maybe you're the only honest, you know, sort of real Christian they've met. Maybe they've run into a lot of people that you know, really don't care about them but have an agenda for their life. And, and so as you interact in a way that says, listen, you know, God loves you, I love you, you know, I'd love to talk with you about this kind of stuff. You may be the only, you know, sort of authentic Christian that, um, you know, that talks with them. I shared with you a couple of years ago, this is fun, this is the third year in this, so... Um, that I had this interesting experience. It wasn't anything by me at all. I didn't do a thing. Um, but I ran into, when I was in high school, I just graduated, I ran into a young woman who I'd known in high school who had dropped out of high school because she had a baby. And I met her at the mall. And, um, and she was putting her baby back into the car and I said hi to her, her name was Joy. And I said, can I see your baby? And she said, sure. And so she brought him back out. And I sort of played with the baby for a while. And then I said, well, it's really great to see you. And I left. And a friend came up to me later and said, you know, I was talking to Joy the other day. And she was so happy about this visit that she had with you. She felt like you were the first Christian that she'd seen that didn't say, you know, you're bad because you got pregnant. And you never should have done that. And, and what was weird was I had no idea any of that was happening. I mean, I really didn't. I just was there. It was, I was glad to see her, enjoyed playing with the baby. But, but for her, that was this big, you know, this big thing about not feeling rejected by God and by Christians, but rather feeling like maybe she could still be a part of things. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And, and how do we spread hope with other people? So preaching by our deeds rather than our words. And, um, and we have... A gospel, and he talks a lot about that, this good news story that is really shaped by hope. It's all shaped around hope, and people desperately need hope today. So four parts to hope, and then we'll, uh, we'll go on to our groups and everything. But one of the things that he does, and you know, you've got to remember that Smith, um, and this is where I'm very congruent with him. There's obviously things I don't agree with him about, and we'll talk about some of those as we go through the good, beautiful community as well. But, but one of the things that's congruent that I'm congruent with Smith on is that we've been given this new life in Christ, and so this new life in Christ has has begun in us, and God is changing us. And so there's a real sense in which, when we put our faith in Christ, then we die to the old way of life. And we are actually resurrected into a new way of life. There's a point in which we leave sort of the kingdom of this world. We become a part of the kingdom of God. And if you wanted to be literal about it, you could even say we really sort of begin eternal life even at that point. That, that there's this, this sort of marking point. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying it's your conversion experience. But I'm saying, you know, because we all come to faith in Christ in different ways. Some of us have always believed. But there's this point in which... We are now, you know, part of God's kingdom and not just what's going on in this world. So one of the things he talks about, you know, is that, that the first part of the story of hope, his first point is that it's about death, which doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? You know, it's like, okay, good. Well, let's go on to number two. How about that? <laughs> but, but what he's saying is that, you know, he's talking about how because Jesus died, we also have died. We've died to the ways that were displeasing to God. We've died to our old lives. And he gives this great verse. And actually, I love this verse. I used it when I was putting ashes on people's heads, you know, because when we put ashes on, we say, you know, dust to dust, you know, um, ashes to ashes, or we talk about our mortality, right? And that's a good thing for us. It's a good confessional piece, reminds us that we're human. 
But that's not the whole story anymore. So he says, you know, he quotes Colossians 3.3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So when I put ashes on somebody, I say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But then I say, remember that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. You see, that's the good news of the gospel, that the things that used to undo us, the things that you know became those things that held us down or the places we couldn't receive forgiveness, we couldn't be restored, the things that tormented us, God has put those things to death to bring new life. And that's number two, is that we have resurrection. So, so we've died with Christ. Now, you know, if you read the mystics and everybody, they're all, they've got all kinds of different ways of um, trying to figure out how all this works. Like, you know, did it literally happen? Did it not literally happen? But I think it's a spiritual truth that when our life is hid with Christ and God, we've died to the old ways. We've been resurrected to a new kind of life. And so, um, so we are risen also with Christ. And Paul would say it this way in Ephesians. He would say that, um, that the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is now at work in you. Now, just stop and think about that for a second. Do you ever feel powerless? Ever feel like you can't do something? Have you ever thought about the fact that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you through the Holy Spirit? That's pretty profound. So, you know, in these times when you're not sure where you're going to get what you need, uh, God's going to supply it. Because it's not just you walking alone, but God's walking with you as well. The third thing he says is that, um, you know, is he talks about Christ being ascended, but also us being ascended. And here, Smith is saying basically that we're now a part of, you know, this larger kingdom, that we also now um, are seeing things set above rather than just things here. We we begin to take a more eternal look at life rather than just simply a daily you know, look at life. We take a, a more eternal look at life. And then the fourth thing he talks about is that, um, that Christ will come again. And for us, you know, that's the reminder that God's going to make all things right in time. That God will make everything that's gone wrong in this world right. And that God's story is our story. That that creates for us a new sense of identity and that leads us into a new way of being. So, so when we're thinking about this whole idea of hope, that's what our hope is based in. It's based in the life, the death, the burial, um, the ascension, the coming of Christ, that he changes everything as we've known it. So we become then, you know, and I think some of the questions are this, um, you know, who am I? And what do I do? Those are sort of the basic questions we always come back to. Well, you are one in whom Christ dwells. Um, you are a part of the unshakable kingdom of God. You will spend eternity with, with God and Christ. So as we live out this Christian life in front of others, we get a chance to be able to talk and share about this hope that's in us. So I pray today that that would really... Um, would really be a part of you, um, that you'd be able not only to find places to share that, but that you would experience even more hope because of God's goodness and grace for us in Christ. So let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you have acted in ways that we didn't know how to act. You've done things that we never could have done. You um, are a God of hope who gives us um, hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, for each one of us that that would be true in us, but also that your hope would bubble up in us in a way that, um, that other people would capture it also, that they would see it and they'd ask us about it so that they also might come to know that, that, they, that, you are, that, you, that, that you see them as valuable as well. God, break down those barriers that keep people from coming to know you, um, that they might also understand your grace and peace. And God, be with us as we go to groups now. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, thank you. Good.